Come back to the channel, guys. Eugene Cousins here. Some of you guys know me as the XC Guru. Some of you know me as the Nirvana guy. Some of you think of me as the Dudek Wingman guy, but I'm just the guy talking about relevant PPG stuff. And today's topic is about the state of PPG. And I, I'm not referring to anything bad happening in PPG, but really the development cycles and where we started and where we're heading. It can be confusing because you got such a wide variety of engines and as a reference point for the everyday pilot, we look to social media. Bill wants to know from Bob how he finds that motor and Joe wants to know from John if he thinks this lighter is going to be best for him. And social media is a dangerous place to get performance statistics and uh, whether a machine is the perfect use or not. So in the old days, and when I say the old days, it's just, you know, as a reference point where things started from when all motors were still heavy, it was slalom racing. Manufacturers were using the same or trying to, to sell the same machine that would be used uh, in slalom racing. And so it was all about heavy motors, larger combustion, bigger horsepower outputs, the tiniest possible glider, and then ripping through those pylons. And it's still relevant today because everybody loves the F1 of PPG. It's fun to, it's fun to watch, but it really isn't um, a good reference point for how we fly on a daily basis. Uh, so let's define what's flying on a daily basis. Flying on a daily basis is the guy that likes to go for a short hop with his buddies um, between 30 minutes and an hour and a half. That's what the average pilot flies, and that's how we developed even the, the Ranger unit with the Nirvanas, because most pilots don't fly more than two hours, 20 minutes on a fuel tank, and so we thought that was would be the ideal range. Um, but I think that the real revolution happened for the everyday pilot when Viterazzi brought out their 185 Moster and uh, Air Conception started using that Nitro 200. That was the, uh, the point where pilots really found what they were looking for on a daily basis. You had a lightweight unit with a small engine putting out pretty decent power and it could give them enough range to do that 30 minutes to an hour and a half. Um, but you can't look at those machines and then look at the slalom racing circuit to know if the motor that you picked or the gear that you're picking really is uh, really really is reliable or fits what you're looking for. So slalom isn't a reference point. That's what I'm getting to. Slalom is not a reference point for the everyday flying. What is relevant to everyday flying is looking at something like the Icarus, where guys were using their everyday machines. Uh, adapted them with loading up camping gear and fuel bags and whatever else to try and fly for longer distances and to do cross-country flying. So if we had something in cross-country racing which was more average, which could compare to slalom racing, it would be the ideal reference points for, for people to look to every day to say, listen, I think this lighter is best for me uh, or I think uh, this motor uh, is reliable enough and fits the kind of lifestyle flying that I'm doing. Um, so I've spoken about Viterazzi and Nitro, and I've given them, the, or Air Conception, I've given them credit for taking that step and creating the revolution. I was there back in the day when Nirvana decided, listen, they've got to commit on a direction of lifestyle and cross-country flying. It's what they wanted to do. They wanted to move away from heavier motors. And Pavel Brazina, the owner of Nirvana, started developing that wonderful air flight that we now have in the 160 and the F200. Uh, two very different offerings, but basically the concept uh, that Nirvana went with in a development uh, was to create something that you could use on an everyday basis, is super lightweight, somewhere between 40 and 45 pounds, that can give you super range and, uh, and super reliability. You know, Nirvana's always been known for its reliability, so to have something that's lightweight and reliable that just makes sense. Uh, the engine had to change completely, so it became a computerized unit where the spark comes from a battery and computer, no longer from the engine. A lot, a lot of weight cutting that went onto that unit. But the design is also very important where it can convert into a backpack and you've got this waist strap and you can actually hike on with it if you've landed somewhere um, and uh, the weather doesn't play along and you have to continue on your trip. You can take a taxi or a train or you can hike on. So there was a lot of brain power behind um, the, the design of the F-Lite. Now you've got, and it's just not, you know, a, a lot of manufacturers are out there, they buy the Viterazzi motor and they design their own frame, um, and then they go to market with this, uh, with an offering. So now that we have all these different manufacturers, 
on the motor side and on the glider side, just think about the gliders. You go onto uh, websites like Apco, Dudek, Ozone, um, Flow, uh, or, uh, and you look at what they're doing, they're all starting to create specialized cross-country gliders. And I'm this, this is the point I'm trying to get to. Whether you're looking at the motor brands or whether you're looking at the glider brands, you will start noticing that cross-country has become a very key initiative in their design portfolio. In Dudek, you have the Warp, you have the Hadron 3, you have the Universal, um, and there's quite a few others. And on, let's say, for example, on Flow, you've got the RPM, Specialized Cross-Country Glider. Uh, you've, got, um, uh, you've got, what else is there? The APCO, they made the F1 a Specialized Cross-Country Glider. There's too few to, there's, there's, there's too many to mention. But the point is, is you'll notice that cross-country has become a big topic within PPG, and it's because it's relatable to everyday flying. That same motor used in long-range cross-country is also great to use for your everyday flight. All right, so now we've covered where we'll be able to notice that cross-country and slalom, two very different things, but cross-country has become more relevant as a reference point for the everyday pilot. All right, now from my side, what I'm going to be doing in 2022 I'm going to be focusing on that on the Speedrun Cup project, but also on expedition flying. And I'm trying to do that specifically to show you guys what the full capability uh, of the modern technology and all these new products that are coming out that specialize for cross country. What, are, what, what is the full capability of all this? So for those of you that don't know what the Speedrun Cup is about, Speedrun Cup is a medium range cross country race, somewhere between 140 and 200 kilometers. Uh, first pilot to finish an out and back track with one mandatory landing spot. Sometimes we do two. First pilot to finish that wins, which means what? It means that the pilots and the different brands that are competing in this race are pushing those machines way harder than anything else there. If you think about slalom, they finish within a few minutes. In cross-country racing, we're flying to the maximum speed of a cross-country glider which is these days very fast, and you're flying that and you're flying at the maximum RPM for the full amount of time. So it's being on the speed bar for the complete uh, period of a race, which can be two to four hours. So the guys are getting hammered doing this, but more importantly, the gear is being hammered. And if it can survive within the speed run cup, pilots should know that it is a great brand to go with. Uh, as far as everyday flying goes. Whatever it's being pushed to do uh, in the limits of the Speedrun Cup is going to be great for everyday flying. And it's giving manufacturers the opportunity to improve whatever is, is, uh, is not surviving. So if there's exhaust cracks coming in the Speedrun Cup, after an hour's worth of flying or hard pushing, or there's seizures, engine seizures coming, then the manufacturers can spend the time to try and fix that by increasing cooling or fixing the vibration or whatever else. So these kinds of races are really great for manufacturers, and it really was a great initiative with the Icarus because, let me tell you what, a lot of people think that uh, the adventure, the, the Icarus is just an adventure that a whole bunch of pilots sign up and they finish and they just had an awesome time. But you guys should be looking at the statistics of how many engine seizures and breakages there are on something like the Icarus. Uh, I can tell you about, you know, even just the Icaruses that I did, there were so many engine seizures. Uh, whereas, you know, an average you'd have 20 to 25 pilots taking part in a Icarus and three to four would finish the race in race class, which means what happened to the rest? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, on the Speed Run Cup, uh, we have four, we had four races in 2021 in South Africa and it's going to go uh, international. It's going to go to the US, Middle East and Europe and you have a whole bunch of great pilots in those regions that'll have a new form of category to race in. And being good in one form of racing does not automatically mean that you're great in another form of racing because, especially in cross country, it takes a lot of pilot knowledge, you know, a lot of knowledge on weather, on calculations, um, on um, gear design, and, well, I would suggest general aviation, um, general aviation topics, which you might not have practiced if you were just doing short rips through pylons. So, acro guys, the same way. I've had so many pilots that have come on board in the Speedrun Cup, and we had something between 15 and 20 pilots taking part in each one of these races. Um, uh, and a lot of guys just told me they had no idea that cross-country can be so tough. 
So we have a couple of big teams in the, in the Speedrun Cup already. Well, we've got the Nirvana Racing team, which I'm taking care of, and we've got the Red Bull team, and we're hoping to increase the sizes of both teams. And there will be more teams coming into the fold as well. Some really exciting things happening uh, in the Speedrun Cup. Then um, the, uh, the, exhibition, the, the, the expedition flying is, is an initiative that I'm trying to do where I'm trying to showcase the full capability of machines being used in long range flying. So I'm gonna be flying some really isolated places where there's no ground support. I'll be flying with a GPS tracker, but there really is no help if I send a message out from there. I'll have to hike it out or try to use local villages or whatever else uh, to get me out of those places. But I've got enough faith in my Nirvana after doing all of these different races and long range flying that I think that I can trust the motor to do things like that. And by doing it, I will show the full capability of what long range flying can, uh, can mean to most pilots when they get uh, into the future, into the, the, the mindset of what the, the future of this sport really can be when we start using it to its full potential. All right, um, next few days, I've got a few pilots that have come to visit uh, from uh, all over. They're new participants to the Speedrun Cup and we're gonna see more brands taking part. You've got Polini now with a 202 coming in to the Speedrun Cup with new types of gliders. Um, you've got uh, Viterazzi 185, uh, this, you know, the Red Bull team has switched over to. And in the next few days, I'll have some numbers on how they perform, and then hopefully we can see how they stack up in this preseason joust. All right, guys, uh, on to the next video, and I'll be seeing you soon.